Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Budd. Uh, welcome again, everybody, to BCC. And um, just kind of in really in the spirit of, you know, just this moment right now, I just wanted to uh, share with everybody the, the question that we had on campus for this month's celebration of Black History was, uh, what does uh, Black History mean to you in the 21st century? And, um, and I just wanted to uh, just share how how thrilled I am to have an old friend here before us who can uh, share some of his work and also uh, one of his colleagues, one of his collaborators with, from his book, uh, Street Lit. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from, uh, this is actually is from uh, Ralph Ellison, his book, Shadow and Act. And um, it's an introduction, it's about Mahalia Jackson. Um, but I, I also think that is really fitting for the work that you're going to hear tonight. Um, if you can just kind of change, change things up a little bit and, and, and think about just talking about artists in general, not necessarily one specific artist. And then I believe that you'll see how uh, the writers who are joining us today and sharing their work uh, really fit into the spirit that uh, Ralph Ellison speaks of here. And he says, there are certain women singers who possess, beyond all the boundaries of our admiration for their art, an uncanny power to evoke our love. We warm with pleasure at mere mention of their names. Their simplest songs sing in our hearts like the remembered voices of old dear friends. And when we are lost within the listening an anonymity of darkened concert halls, they seem to seek us out unerringly. Standing regal within the bright isolation of the stage, their Subtlest effects seem meant for us and us alone, privately, as across the intimate space of our own living rooms. And when we encounter the simple dignity of their immediate presence, we suddenly ponder the mystery of human greatness. Perhaps this power springs from their dedication, their having su subjected themselves successfully to the demanding disciplines necessary to the mastery of their chosen art or perhaps it is the quality with which they are born, as some are born with bright orange hair. Perhaps though, we think not. It is not acquired, a technique of presence. But whatever its source, it touches us as a rich abundance of human warmth and sympathy. Indeed, we feel that if the idea of arist arist aristocracy is more than mere class conceit, then there surely are a few natural queens. For they enchant the eye as they caress the ear, and in the presence we sense full moony glory of womanhood and all its mystery, maid, matron, and matriarch. They are the sincere ones who, who, whose humanity dominates the artifices of the art with which they stir us, and when they sing, we have some notion of our better selves. Um, I, I found that that really is fitting for my experience of reading Brother and the Dancer. Um, um, maybe Keenan can't hit some of those notes that Mahalia hits, but uh, definitely hitting that spirit that, uh, that uh, Ralph Ellison speaks of there. And so um, in celebration of black history in, in uh, an institution of higher education, we know that history is not just a series of, of dates or collection of names. History is a competing battle of narrative and story, and it's only feeling, fitting that we uh, close uh, our Black History Month with, uh, with those stories that, that uh, shape our understanding and uh, shape our engagement with our history. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Keenan Norris. Thank you um, for coming out. And <clears throat> One second. I had just a few remarks that that I put together for for today, and I wanted to mostly talk about my novel *Brother and the Dancer* that Cleavon referenced. You know, one of my favorite writers and a writer I've been um, reading a lot lately is Cormac McCarthy who's you know, not an African-American writer, 
um, won't be included in black history, but it's taught me a lot about, a lot about writing. Um, McCarthy's most famous book is a book called Blood Meridian. It's really interesting. When um, I grew up in Highland, San Bernardino area of Southern California, going out toward the desert, we had one black bookstore out there, and it was run by this guy, um, a good friend of mine, Farron Roberts. And Farron told me, he, he actually introduced me to Mark McCarthy in, a, in an interesting way. He, he told me that he had a, a uh, customer who would come in often and told him that you know, he had spent several years in the pen, several, several years locked up. And what kind of pulled him through that time was his reading, was reading about, was reading Blood Meridian, which is McCarthy's most famous book. He said he read it, you know, like 10 times while he was in, uh, while he was in prison. And if you've read Blood Meridian, you know that it's a tale about, you know, violence and um, the kind of um, peculiar nature of violence in America. So <clears throat> that book begins with the famous line, see the child. That's the first sentence of the book, very famous opening line, see the child. And I think if I had, had the chance to go back and give my novel an epigram, it would be precisely that, see the child. Because the book itself is about two children, two young people, um, Toussaint, young man, Erica, young girl, um, young, black, and gifted growing up in that area, going out toward the desert in the 1980s, 1990s. And I find the uh, question, it's not up there anymore, um, that great board that you guys, uh, that, that Berkeley City College had, their stu had the students write on, I found it, find it very apropos to uh, the subject of my book because, you know, the story in large part is about what it means to be a young black person in post-civil post -civil rights era America and the kind of competing tensions that are going on there. Um, you know, whereas in you know, the vast majority of American history, we were you know, legally segregated from the majority population. We were, you know, in many ways, a people apart. As we've been you know, um, kind of fitfully integrated into, into America, <clears throat> and as class has emerged you know, much more, you know, more and more largely as a um, kind of necessary, you know, uh, as a dominant factor in how we deal with each other, you know, amongst, you know, between black people. Um, I think it's changed, you know, changed the way we, we relate to one another. So I find again, you know, what does black history mean um, in the 21st century to be a very profound question. So the book um, is partly about that emergent class divide. So both the, the kind of starting point for the story is a college orientation. And some of you may have um, experienced something very similar to this. Erica and Tucson meet each other at a University of California um, <clears throat> orientation. And they figure that they're going to, you know, that they're going to get along and they're going to like each other because they're two of the only black students there, right? First of all, they're two of the only black students there. And on top of it, they are, you know, um, also from the same hometown. So they figure, okay, this is gonna work out. And what they find over the course of the day is they actually hate each other. And, they, and on top of it, they've been lying to each other the whole time that they've been, you know, that they've been talking to each other. So they spend the whole day together and like, I can't stand this other person. Um, and so they're, and what, what we find is even though they are two of the only black people there, and you know, I'm sure for the black people you know, in the audience, you, you probably had this experience before where it's like you and one other person and there are like 500 people in the room, but you and that other person are, the, you know, are just expected to somehow like magically find each other, you know, and you know, like you have magnets on you or something. And that's, uh, you know, and so Eric and Tucson have that expectation of themselves, right, and of each other, and they're disappointed in that, right, they don't, they don't, um, they're disappointed in, in, you know, in that, uh, in that quest. So, 
in, um, in this process, right, they, uh, they come to find out that they're very different from one another. Erica is from the wrong side of the tracks. Tucson's from the suburbs, even though they're from the same kind of small hometown. That town, like many others in this country, is divided by a freeway, right? And they live on opposite sides of the freeway. And those opposite sides, right, um, say more, you know, say more about them, develop their personalities in ways just as profound as their blackness, right? Class is just as profound a, you know, a, uh, um, a creator, you know, of, of ourselves as, as is race. And so <clears throat> there's that, and there are other things as well. So there's, um, so I can talk about the book as kind of a sociological document. I can talk about it as kind of what it means to be young, black, and gifted at a crossroads in black culture. I can talk about it on that level. But I think part of the challenge of being a black writer um, is that, you know, everything that we write is automatically seen as political, right? Um, especially, you know, with other black folks, all the way with everybody, right? It's like you're always making a statement for the entire race, right? And that's, um, that's problematic, right? It's like you're always, you know, um, somebody said to me earlier, you know, at, at their job, they feel like, you know, they're the go-to person, they just want to make their email address, you know, the black man. <laughs> um, and so, you know, at their, at their institution. And so, <clears throat> There's that way when you're a writer, it's, you know, it's very similar, right? What, you know, how does this character, right, um, represent the entirety of your people, right? And that, that's problematic because while literature is always political, right, entertainment is always political, music is always political, film is always political, it also can't be reduced to politics, right? It can't be reduced to politics, it's more than just politics. And <clears throat> It also has to live on the level of, in this case with literature, has to live on the level of sentence, has to live on the level of stories. So, <clears throat> you know, it has to work on those levels too. So, um, I just wanted to start off with those comments. Um, we can, I know um, few that we are, we, you know, we're family here, right? So, um, we can do this a little more informally. I can read a section or two to you guys or we can uh, break out. I can also, I also want to, because um, my uh, colleague, Khalid White, is, um, uh, he and his crew are so well represented here. I wanna, um, in fact, you know what? Yeah, let's do this. Um, let me also talk about another other book here, Street Lit Representing the Urban Landscape, because um, Khalid and his crew are so nice uh, to, to come out here. I wanna, um, <clears throat> bring some light to that as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Um, so in Brother and the Dancer, my novel, there's this, um, uh, there's this way that, you know, the, first of all, the way the story is structured is that after that college orientation where the two kids decide that they hate each other, the story cycles back to when they're six years old and tells their stories in alternating chapters to explain how they got to be so different, right? So that's the way the book's structured. So we bounce back and forth between Tucson, growing up in the suburbs, um, given the name of Tucson Louverture, for those of you who know your black history, right? Um, Tucson, this icon of the global black freedom struggle, right? Who's, a, uh, <clears throat> who's the leader of, you know, the leader and the um, founder of the only, at least historically recorded, right, successful slave insurrection in the history of the world that founded a nation, that founds the nation of Haiti. So Tucson, our kid, growing up in the Southern California suburbs, is given that name and feels like he kind of has to live up to that, right? So I, um, you know how sometimes you wake up in the morning and you feel like a hero, right? But, no, but then you walk outside and nobody else really is, you know, on the same page with you. Nobody else is on that level. Like I, I, I feel very heroic in the mirror sometimes. <laughs> but not so much outside. Well, I mean, that's how Tucson feels, right? And so you have that part of the story, but then you shift over to Erica's sections, and Erica's living in the hood, right? Um, 
and it's kind of, it's a hood like any other hood in a, in America and it's funny if I were just to um, if you were just to read Erica's sections of her story you would pro you might mistake my book for what we call street lit right um, how many of you guys are familiar with that term street lit okay so a few people right um, so street lit forget exactly the definition that we came up with over at uh, EVC the other day, but <clears throat> it's in the book, right? <laughs> um, the street lit is, first of all, the most um, popular form of black literature, um, literature being produced by black people, by black and brown people today. And you, know, you can think of writers like Terry Woods, Vicki Stringer, Kenji Jasper, Sister Soldier, Omar Tyree, Puri Thomas, Richard Rodriguez, Ixtamaya Murray, as um, examples of you know, street lit writers. So street lit is concerned with the urban experience, right? It's concerned with, um, with kind of the, the negative side of that experience, the dark side of that experience. So <clears throat> like I said, if one were just to take Erica's sections and uh, pull those out of her book, or out of my book, um, it might be mistaken as street lit. And I think that um, quite often street lit gets kind of condescended to because it's seen as you know, not serious enough, right? It's not literature with capital L. Um, and it's funny, I was um, at our talk, uh, we had a panel, uh, Khalid, myself, and another contributor to the book, Alexandria White, over at Evergreen Valley College, where uh, Alex and I teach Khalid teaches at our sister college, San Jose City College. Um, and I reflected that, you know, Juno Diaz, Juno Diaz, who uh, has a presence here, by the way, with Vona, Voices of New Artists, um, at BCC, um, that, uh, um, that Juno's first book, Drown, could very easily be seen as a street-lit book. I teach it every semester in my class that's one level down from 1A, um, so pre-college, you know, level class, and I had a student uh, last semester who said, man, Mr. Norris, this is a hood book, you know, but, you know, Juno got reviewed in the New York Times, he got reviewed in the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his next book, and so his book isn't regarded, his work isn't regarded as street lit, right, because it's kind of had this official sanction, right, of, um, I don't know, the literary powers that be, right? So, <clears throat> so it's funny, you know, it's interesting what gets, you know, um, figured as street lit, what gets figured as serious, right? What gets figured as lowbrow, trashy, ghetto, et cetera, what gets figured as, you know, um, being of high importance. And, you know, maybe there's more to it than just that I only gave Erica half my book. Maybe it's also the book, book won an award, right? Um, maybe it's that, you know, it was published by Heyday Books, a very, a very fine publisher out here in Berkeley, but it was published by Heyday Books, which is known for its artistic merit and not by, say, a, uh, you know, a, a uh, smaller, um, lesser known um, publisher, especially a publisher that, you know, would be associated with black fiction right, with African-American fiction. Um, you know, there are all these ways that, you know, certain things get um, placed, you know, um, in the public imagination above others. So, <clears throat> let's see. We're, I think there are um, a couple ways we can go from here. So I just wanted to, um, like I said, introduce Street Lit as well. So Street Lit representing the urban landscape is a book that I, I edited, it, I put together, I wrote a couple sections of it as well. And the way I came about this was that I was finishing my PhD at UC Riverside and my uh, dissertation subject was the, the history, the historical relationship of black writers to American publishers. And you know, that was just you know, my kind of esoteric interest as a scholar and as a writer kicking around the publishing industry for 10 years trying to get a book, book published, I got interested in that history and the journey of other black writers. But <clears throat> in, uh, 
in that process, right, I realized that I couldn't really write about it faithfully without writing about street lit. Right? I couldn't really write faithfully about, um, you know, about the history, you know, of black writers in the publishing industry without writing about street lit because they're, they're the people who are publishing most of the books. If you go to a bookstore and look at the African-American section of it, it's going to be almost all street lit, right? Um, and again, it's not seen as serious and all that stuff, but it's what's there, right? It's what people are actually reading. So I realized I was going to have to, one, learn more about it and to, you know, um, write about it. But I realized no matter how much I got into it, I was never going to be an expert on the subject. So <clears throat> what I ended up doing um, was I got a, a book contract from Scarecrow Press, and I can talk about how that happened. But um, mysteriously, somehow I got this book contract, and I decided to, they gave me two options. They said either you can write this book yourself about street lit, or you can make it an anthology, write as a collection, you know, of essays, interviews, etc., of scholars from around the country writing about street lit. And um, so I went to my advisor, my graduate school advisor, and said, you know, what do you think I should do? You know, which, which way do you think I should go with this? And she said, well, if you want to get anything done, you know the old saying, you know, do it yourself, right? Um, but she said the other way is a far more generous way to go. But nobody's going to turn anything into you on time. You know, everybody's going to be late with everything. You're going to have to be, you know, hounding people, you know, for you know, setting new deadlines, all this stuff. So I said, okay, that, that doesn't sound fun. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, though, because it still sounds easier than writing the book myself. So, <clears throat> so I decided to um, become a project manager, you know, and to bring people in on this, uh, on this endeavor. And what we have here is the first um, multi-author critical collection of, again, essays, interviews, et cetera, on street lit. And my... my uh, See, I, you know, I, I got a PhD for a reason. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that stupid. So I, uh, what I figured was if I got graduate students as opposed to, you know, minute professors with, you know, 10 books behind their names and, you know, show, um, appearances on CNN and everything, if I got people who were still hungry, still interested in, um, in publishing and would put you know, our project on the front burner and not on their back burner, that we could actually get it in, get everything done on time. And so we actually met all our deadlines, right? Um, worked with graduate students from Harvard, from University of Alabama, from Berkeley, uh, from UC Davis, right? Um, from, and from all over the country, and actually also outside of the country. So we had two scholars from the University of, the Federal University of Bahia in Brazil, who also collaborated on the book with us. So <clears throat> um, by way of introduction at this point, um, what's up? Um, OK, before I, before, I introduce, before I introduce Khalid, I guess I, I can read, read you guys a couple sections. But um, let me, uh, so this is my smooth transition back into, back into reading this. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll come back to I'll come back to come back to street lit. But I think maybe the best way to segue to segue back into uh, my book is to now that you have an idea of what street lit is, to listen to the section that I'm going to read to you guys from Erica's story. So it says here, Erica was a dancer without without a dance floor. By the way, um, Erica, growing up in the hood, has as her, um, her prime ambition to become a ballerina, right? Um, she is, uh, well, you, you, you'll, you'll um, I think you'll get the gist of it from what I read here. That's how she thought of herself, a chemical outside its element. It would have been one thing to pop and lock or step or break dance. Break dancers especially had it good. Their dance floor was a piece of cardboard in a street corner or an abandoned warehouse or somebody's garage, maybe she would have to figure out how cardboard and a ballerina could dance together. And the winners, the mission, 
held a talent show to raise funds for stopping violence or AIDS or something, but she never competed because she knew it would turn into more of a popularity contest than a real talent show. Besides, there was no way for her to compete. Other than the steppers, the only talent at the show was the little half-decent rappers. Ricky was in that group. Ricky was in that group, and that was the only reason she even paid the talent show the slightest mind year after year. Rick had a troubled relationship, so Rick is her boyfriend, with the talent show. Every year it treated him wrong. The last year he competed, he had an entire entourage of young girls there to support him. So did almost all the other local rappers, too. But one out-of-town kid who came, came to the show alone and didn't even bother to tell the crowd his name dug Ricky's rapping grave and threw him inside. He locked eyes with Erica and told her that the only time her dude saw a hood was when he put on his jacket. His whole hardness was fabricated and tainted. Fuck Ricky's freelance hustling. Might as well go sell bean pies with the Muslims. Walk, watching Ricky have to stand there, hearing the well-honed shit she had to he had to take without any chance to defend himself, and noting how the whole crowd, including all his girls, turned on him actually hurt her. She found herself alone with him behind the stage curtains. She wondered how the nameless unknown knew that she, she was Rick's only real girlfriend. Probably something about the way she watched him. The whole thing was wrong, but appropriate. She cuddled her man and nipped at his chin with her lips. Despite herself, she'd grown painfully close to him. He wasn't exactly the person he, she dreamt about, but his reality was close to her, hers, and he cared about her. And it surprised her just how much she could return that feeling and care for him to the point of pain. She gazed through the thin, revealing curtain that separated stage and backstage and rendered everyone visible to everyone else. Ever, to everyone else, she looked out at the crowd and noted the blue and red and purple bandanas and how each cheer had its own color, blue or red or purple, always matching, never broken. The unknown rapper would be dismissed too because he was unaffiliated, as was Ricky. The show, as usual, had degenerated into a turf squabble between gang sets. So it's kind of like um, a hood version of American Idol or The Voice, right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has ever been to a talent show like that, but I have. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, it's just, you know, it's everybody there is like affiliated, you know, um, with one gang or another, and they're just, you know, calling out their gang sets. And these two guys, they're unaffiliated, so um, nobody has time for them. And eventually, they both get voted off the island, right? And <clears throat> Erica tells her man, you know, it's unfair. She tells him, unfair, she whispers in his ear. But later, after the talent show was over and she had taken herself home for the night, she decided that the real unfairness wasn't what had happened to the unaffiliated rappers, but rather the talent show's basic exclusivity. Ricky would be more than fine as long as he could stay alive and free. She wasn't too worried about him. But now that she was away from him and her head was clear of stupid romantic thoughts, she thought about what was acceptable in her world and what was denied outright. That the talent show denied much more than it accepted was obvious. Rapping and stepping was everything. The boys rapped, the girls stepped, and that was it. She straight up hated rap music, but stepping she actually enjoyed. Every time she danced with some random step squad and felt the er energy earthquaking across the stage and into the crowd, she realized that this was actually what people wanted to watch. And she felt the threads of ballet fraying a little more in her hands. It was what it was. She understood ballet had never done anything for black girls, so black girls weren't trying to have time for it. Stepping was home truth while ballet was another, another world entirely. But as easy as Erica knew it would be to let go, to let go of ballet, she also didn't want to leave behind she also didn't want to be bound up by invisible communal ties and bindings. Leaving ballet behind would guarantee that bondage. She wanted to leave it behind, yet she still wanted to be part of that other world that it called her to. She wanted to work out the contradictions the dancing led her to. She needed to talk to somebody about these things to speak on what she wanted and how that agreed and disagreed with what her community wanted and about the smallness of youth culture and the wild, troublesome loveliness of black culture and how she was reaching after the strands of all these many things, the strands getting thinner and thinner at her fingertips. She almost picked up the phone to call Ricky, but then didn't. She knew how that would go. So, right, you get the idea of the kind of tension, right, between her community and, you know, her desires, right? Um, her sense of, you know, where her sense of, of fulfillment is coming from. So that's some of Erica. And, <clears throat> like I said, um, if you reduce the book to just her story, it would be much more of a street lit story. But you also have Toussaint there. And um, let me see. So, <clears throat> but at this point, I would like to 
bring Khalid on up. So let me, let me formally introduce him first, though, right? Um, even though I know like half of y'all already know him. <laughs> um, so Brother Khalid White is a colleague of mine, teaches ethnic studies at San Jose City College, also is a doctoral candidate in the education program at University of California, Davis, and is a co-contributor to our Street Lit Anthology. I, um, <clears throat> Clint and I have talked about Street Lit, yeah, come on up. Have talked about you know, kind of staging a dialogue around some of the um, topics in, in, street, in our Street Lit Anthology. So I have a couple questions actually for you. So I'm gonna stand aside and give him the mic and I'll just become the uh, interviewer for a second. Too. I think, Lala, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, cool. So, let's see. Um, first question. As an educator, what do you think is the value of street lit as an educator? <coughs> okay, that's a good question. Um, as an educator, I think the value of street lit take off the street, it still is literature. Mm -hmm. So the themes and the use of everyday language, the use of um, situations that youth and young adults are dealing with on a day in, day out basis mm -hmm. um, that are depicted in the book, I think that's the value of it. It is literature that they can relate to, they can grasp onto, and um, it kind of draws them in. So I think that's the value. And you know, it, you. Um, you pick it up as literature, but it draws you in in terms of um, the ability for you to relate to it. Right. So I think when you have classes, particularly I remember my you know English classes in college, and we read Shakespeare and Chaucer and stuff that was just dry as a bone, right? <laughs> I would have much more appreciated street literature as a genre that I could understand what they were saying. I could relate to the you know events in the book, and so I think that's where you get the uh, the actual uh, usefulness and the utility of street lit. Yeah. I, I agree, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and what about as a just as as a reader? Yeah. As a reader. As what, a reader. What, what's I know um, I know the answer already. <laughs> To, to this question, but as a reader, what what uh what moves you about street? Lit? What what's your reaction to street lit as a reader? Well, um, I am a I consider myself a you know an educator and an academic by day, but by night I'm a street lit connoisseur. So <laughs> you know I love it. Um, I love the I love the um, the ability to turn off the academic brain. And click on and, and you know dive into the brain that the other side of the brain that is um, you know could let me un unwind and escape and um, you know still read but read stuff that I like to read. read read things that you know I enjoy and topics I enjoy and street lit is, is a topic like that or is that topic and so um, you know it, it captivated me the first time I picked up a street lit novel which was the coldest winter ever and from then I was hooked it's almost like um, you see or read something that speaks directly to you. I felt like you know that that novel was talking directly to me. Mm -hmm. um, Winter, mm -hmm. you know the the main character of the novel was sitting there right there telling me her story, right. and so it drew me in. And from there, you know, I was about maybe twenty twenty one when I when I read that book, and for the last ten years, twelve years, I've been, yeah. you know, reading street lit by by night every night, pretty much. Yeah. And, yeah. Um. So and to you know kind of address. Um, an elephant in the room. We, um, you know, as as educators, we're trying to engage you sure. know, our our student body, and especially our, you know, as black educators, our black student body. Absolutely. And um, and that's not always easy to do because you know, they have multiple things pulling on them, um, and oftentimes they're keeping them outside of college doors. I think that um, you know the road to and not to hold my book up again as, you know, um, any kind of high art piece, because it is. <laughs> we, we have some disagreement here. It um, is. But, uh, 
you know, um, the road to it might be a little longer, you know, a little further than um, the road to Iceberg Slim or Donald Goins um, or Sister Soldier. Mm -hmm. And so um, I also think that, you know, street lit can be a gateway. I mean, I think that that's, again, part of the idea of, you know, um, bringing the collection to the fore is to, you know, this is an academic book, right? And it's being sold to academics um, primarily. Anybody can buy it, you know. Um, but it's being sold to academics. <laughs> um, it's being sold to colleges. And so it's the idea is that we want to sensitize educators to the, you know, to the potential, the potential value of street lit as, as a gateway, right? Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little more about, uh, you touched on it a little bit, but uh, street lit as a gateway? The way I've seen street lit used most frequently as a gateway. Um, prior to me going into education full time, I worked in the um, youth corrections and probation department. And in terms of getting somebody to actually pick up something useful, relevant, something that could put some, you know, some sense into their mind. Um, well, let me take a step back. If you are, if you're unfamiliar with the um, probation and correction department, the, the youth that are housed there in lack of facilities have to go to school. Okay? Part of the, the state mandate is that the youth go to school while they're locked up. And so as an educator, you know, um, I would see the schools that the youth would go to while on lockup. And in my opinion, my, my humble opinion, they were subpar, substandard, mm -hmm. right? Do this ditto while I read the paper you guys don't make sure you don't kill each other, and then in 30 minutes later, I'll collect this ditto from you, okay? So I would um, challenge some of the youth on the living units to pick up a book and read a book. I couldn't get them to read anything intellectual, in my opinion, but they would read street lit. So it was a gateway for us where I saw youth, particularly young men, to pick up books, to open their mind up a little bit to, even though the subject matter was, you know, um, maybe not the most academic or academically challenging, but once they picked up the street lit books, they couldn't put them down. They would ask me for more and more titles and where could I get this from and that from and do you have you know, part two to this book and part three to that book. And so I saw that as a gateway directly used to um, address the you know, literacy for young adults, young men in particular, young men in color and lock up. So I think that that was one way I've seen it used as a gateway. Another, you know, I use and in, in, in incorporate some street lit into my own classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, especially for young men, you know. Absolutely. It's, you know, for whatever reason, it's much easier to, and this isn't just black people, it's just across races, it's much easier to, you know, capture and bring in, you know, women, young women into, into literature. And, you know, I think that's critical on a lot of levels. We talked in uh, our panel the other day about how a lot of street lit, has, a lot of street lit texts have been converted into movies you know, been adapted into, into film. But there are just things that you can do with a book. There's a level of depth and complexity you can get to in a book that you just never will be able to in a two hour film, you know, or an hour and a half film. Um, so, yeah, um, so we're constantly, you know, trying to figure out ways to, um, to, to engage that population. Um, you know, guys, in other words. Um, so with that, I don't know. Would this be a good time to maybe open it up to questions from, from the audience? Yeah. Okay, I can definitely do that. Um, okay, well, I'll just start from the beginning. So uh, I wrote the introduction to the book and later on uh, one of the essays in the book. So my intro is called Street Lit and then in brackets, the rest of the word literature in America past and present. And it begins, let's see, 
that it's my great pleasure as the editor of this collection to bring to the fore this groundbreaking collection of essays, interviews, and other literature. The, uh, this volume represents the most diverse and most thorough examination of the literary and commercial, commercial phenomenon that is contemporary street literature, popularly known as street lit, urban lit, or hip hop fiction. Um, certainly much ink has been devoted to the reemergence of the genre of American literature over the past decade or so. Um, from the meditations of Ger Gerald Early in his essay, What is African American Literature? to the blog scholarship at racialicious.com uh, racialicious and madamnoir.com, <clears throat> Street Lit has captured the attention of not only a wide readership, but also a vast cadre of social commentators. There, and I go through some of the essential texts on this. Um, there's also on NPR, Karen Grigsby ba uh, Bates for a long time was doing a uh, segment on the literature of black and brown America that mostly focused on street lit and its impact on the publishing industry. So I go through all that, talk about the controversy around street lit in a October 3rd, 2007 email to publishing executives Car Carolyn Reedy at Simon & Schuster, Karen Hunter, uh, Karen Hunter Publishing, and Louise Burke at Gallery Books. Terry McMillan excoriates not only the immediate recipients, but the quote unquote other publishing houses for their relentless publication, quote unquote, of what Macmillan characterizes as exploitive, destructive, racist, egregious, sexist, base, tacky, poorly written, unedited, degrading books, end quote. I don't think she likes it. Other than all that, she's cool with it, right? Um, the immediate re reason for Macmillan's email was the publication of Corrine Steffens. Y'all remember Corrine Steffens or heard of her? Anyway. Um, Corrine Steffen's memoir, Confessions of a Video Vixen. She's more, you know, okay, I, uh, we have a mixed audience here in terms of age, so I'm gonna um, not talk about what she's best known for. Um, <laughs> wherein the former music video model recounted her unromantic affairs with Jay-Z, Ja Rule, Shaquille O'Neal, Cool G Rap, and others. Uh, Macmillan, whose work ironically inspired much of the trend she so despises, promises that in concert with, quote, a number of black bookstores and other black literary organizations, she will begin to make her disquiet at the publishing industry trend toward trash black literature known to the public. Macmillan's missive even wonders at the fact that whereas literary lumina luminaries, Walter Mosley, Edwidge Donicott, and then Senator Barack Obama were not in the running for publishing house, house imprints, those writers whose <clears throat> who market tales of, bl of black super squalor have been allowed, quote, into the big publishing houses, little rooms enough to finally get their own imprints, end quote. In a similar vein, critically celebrated novelist Bernice McFadden's June 2010 Washington Post article, Black Writers in a Ghetto of the Publishing Industry's Making, recounts McFadden's interface with the publishing industry upon release of her debut novel, Sugar. Hey there. <laughs> I agree with that too. <laughs> the original cover depicted a beautiful black woman standing behind a screen door, Mc McFadden writes, Sugar was marketed solely to African-American readers. This type of marginalization has come to be known among African-American writers as segbookation. This practice is not only demeaning, but also financially crippling, end quote. The marginalization of her work was not solely the result of her publisher's race-based strategy, uh, but also the, pro the product of bookstore separation of titles by black writers. Walk through your local bookstore, and I know bookstores no longer exist, but you know, let's just imagine ourselves back to like two years ago when they still did. Um, that <clears throat> so walk through your local bookstore, and you will not see sections for British literature or Pakistani literature or Chinese literature, blah blah blah. But you will see the Afri African American sections, right? And what she so what she's basically. Um, Stating is that by putting the black character on the front of her book, right, um, the publisher gave a convenient reason for non-black people to, you know, to ignore the book, right? Um, unfortunately, you put black on the title of almost anything. Those, you know, anybody who's marketed an event knows this. Um, put black on the title of almost anything. You bring some people in, but you also turn a lot of people away, right? Um, and I haven't totally figured out what that is, you know, other than in some ways we are still very segregated. You know, we live in a highly segregated society. So, <clears throat> um, so that's some, you know, background. There's also a definition, 
you know, like be very academic. There's a definition somewhere in here of what street lit is. Um, but I think you guys get, not, get the idea. Um, now, here's the thing, right? Um, whereas in general, right, there's a lot of criticism of street lit. I wanted to broaden the conversation out because typically when I talk about when I've talked about um, street lit with my, you know, friends who are writers, you know, many of them black, they'll complain that, you know, like, I can't get my book published or I can't get it published, you know, at the level I want it published at because there are all these people, you know, writing all this trash fiction, right? <clears throat> and so, you know, my stuff can't get, see the light of day. But that's more of a complaint, you know? That's more of a complaint than it is uh, uh, really, a, you know, an in-depth scholarly critique. So I wanted to go a little deeper and to um, get people's opinions and perspectives from around the kind of uh, diaspora of black, uh, black literature. So um, Khalid, for example, with his love of street lit, you know, is in direct contrast to Terry McMillan. You know, what she's saying, the kind of potential of street lit that we've been talking about is in direct contrast to um, that really damning critique that Terry McMillan gave in that open email that she now um, refuses to acknowledge because I tried to get her to, I tried to interview her for the book and she wouldn't give me the time of day. Um, and actually, yeah, she, she no longer, I'm, I'm not sure what this is, but she will no longer, um, you know, uh, acknowledge that that email was ever sent, even though it's all over the internet. Um, so, <clears throat> so you have that as well. Yeah. That's about all I got, though. You want to read from it? Okay. Do you still want me to read? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm just curious to know, before I, I'm not going to read uh, the entire piece, but I'll read a, a snippet of it. Before, um, I just had a question for the audience. Are any educators in the audience? Okay, fantastic, all right. So, um, I don't know if it's just me, but I've, I've noticed recently as educators, I'm sure Keenan and uh, Cleavon can kind of attest to this, as an educator in the classroom, you are up against a number of different um, barriers to a student actually fully engaging, okay? Have I eaten today? Who just texted me? Um, what, you know, what time did I go to sleep last night, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Kind of to go into this idea of the, the use of street lit as an academic way, I think when you hear some of the, again, some of the themes and some of the language from street lit, it kind of it wakes students up to a degree. Now, I'm not saying you have to go in here and um, I'm not suggesting that as educators we teach primarily from, you know, from this textbook, or this as a textbook, although that would be nice, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, you know, um, I, I'm not sure how much the average um, tactics that we as educators use in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, still work today in 2014. And so that's why I feel like, you know, incorporating a little bit of this, sprinkling this here and there kind of brings some life to the classroom, particularly for, for youth today who are up against, you know, so many other challenges as they walk into the classroom. So um, my article that I contributed was, um, kind of goes back to, you know, I teach African American studies, so it kind of goes back to our tradition of the griots and the griots in terms of storytelling. Um, so my, my title is The Art of Storytelling, Hip Hop Music and Its Cousin Street Lit. So, um, just a little bit from it. African American storytelling has deep historical and cultural roots. Those roots extend back to West Africa, where entertaining, enlightening, informing and educating through storytelling was the job of the griot. The translation of the term griot, G-R-I-O-T, means the keeper of tradition. Being a griot was to be in a position of power, of influence, and status in the villages and communities in Africa. The griot, male or griot, um, female, had the prestigious position of being revered, respected, and feared all at the same time for their intelligence, their wisdom, and their undeniable talent for making words come to life in their stories, parables, and proverbs that they told. Through the art of storytelling, the griots educated, motivated, and captivated their audience. So um, in the tradition of teaching, I think most teachers, your pastors, 
or your imams, your um, social political leaders, even your artists, musical artists today, are griots. They keep on, they carry on that tradition. Okay? So it goes on to say, the art of storytelling has and always will be part of who African Americans are collectively. It's one of the many vestiges of the African diaspora that we've held on to. Storytelling is a mainstay in African American culture and it's provided us with a collective voice. Storytelling has been a tool used for our collective survival. The art of storytelling is arguably a black thing. All right. We'll go into kind of a little bit of the role of street lit. Goes on a little bit. I don't want to, you know, belabor the point, but not only an avid, lifelong fan of rap music and hip hop culture, that's me. Okay? Um, there's no denying it. My mom is in the audience, she could tell you, you know, <laughs> that the love of music was in the house, but the love of hip hop music in particular, which kind of is, in my opinion, the cousin of street lit, that's where I kind of get my love of, you know, this, this literary genre from. I too am an avid reader. In addition, professionally, I'm a professor of African American studies at a community college here in the Bay Area. And I sometimes have to reconcile with the fact that I love hip hop and I read street lit to unwind, of course. But I'm expected to teach in an academic environment where these forms of artistic expression are often devalued. It is no secret that many of my students, black, white, Latino, and Asian, lo too love hip hop culture and they read street lit. So I see the books they read, I hear the music they play, Hip hop and street lit traverse ages, races, and ethnicities for sure. All right. As an educator today, I have competition in the classroom, and this is kind of what I'm talking about. I have to compete day in and day out with students' digital, addic digital addictions to texting, web browsing, social networking, and even sexting in the classroom. Okay. Students are often tuned out, plugged in, and more interested in today's trending topics than in topics of discussion in the lectures and the textbooks. So how do I ensure their attention is paid to their education as opposed to their status updates? By using the art of storytelling, by incorporating street lit, by infusing hip hop in the classroom. So if you wanna hear the rest of it, you had to purchase the book right there. <laughs> but thank you. And so thank you both. So thank you both. Uh, we're gonna just sit and um, and open it up for more questions. Uh, just to just talk about whatever else is out there. You know, I have some questions that I would I would love to pose to both of you. Um, and um, and maybe since I have the mic, I will pose the first one. Uh, but and I think Kelly, you just kind of touched on one of the questions I had for you. But it was this this idea of um, situating your art and your love of art. In uh, the in academia, uh, and you know, there is this this sense that academia, the institution, is this what they call like this ideological state apparatus. It is the it is the gatekeeper. It is it is the police force of our culture in a way. Uh, and so, how do you see yourself and your work as community college educators, and also as as uh, as artists? You know, like how do you kind of reconcile those different identities? or if there's any reconciliation is at all? Good question, and especially difficult one to answer, right? Um, because we're working with, um, you know, population of students that has, uh, you know, that has more real world responsibilities, you know, than um, a lot, say, you know, your average student at, um, I don't know, Harvard or Stanford or, um, or UC Berkeley for that matter. And, you know, and so, you know, there's, because they have more, you know, more of these uh, responsibilities um, and a little less free time to, uh, you know, you know, just uh, engage with the abstract world, um, we have to, you know, kind of, first of all, come to them where they're at, right? We have to teach, you know, we have to meet them where they're at. And we have to um, also, like uh, Khalid said, we have to, you know, sprinkle in the, you know, Sprinkle in the art, sprinkle in the um, the the more intellectual fare, right? In such a way that it's um, you know that that it doesn't uh, turn people off or make people think that it's you know totally impractical, you know. Or um, when we get into 
kind of uh, ethnic studies or cultural anthropology, you know, um, and uh, teaching, um, you know, uh, teaching these, you know, kind of histories of resistance and so forth that, you know, again, that could be seen very similarly to art as, you know, um, non-essential, you know, non-essential study. Um, so we, you know, so I think it's, it's especially difficult, you know, how do we um, get people to see that, uh, um, you know, that storytelling is essential, that, you know, I mean, you go back to the, you know, to ancient, you know, ancient man um, and the, you know, drawings on caves that people have been telling stories since the beginning of humanity. And that clearly, even though, you know, it, you know, can't necessarily fill in a space on a, you know, balance sheet, that it has, um, that it, you know, that there's an essential um, value to, to uh, storytelling that is, that, that surpasses, you know, um, economic trends and so forth. And I think that's very difficult. Yeah. Um, I lost sight of the question. Um, kind of to piggyback off what uh, Keenan just mentioned, I think particularly at the community college, you're dealing with students who, um, maybe school wasn't quote unquote their thing, mm -hmm. you know? So again, this idea of meeting a student where they are and helping to, to kind of raise them up to, uh, you know, where, where, you can, where you can get to, uh, where they can get to. You have to meet them where they are first, I think that's important, and then help to bring them up. So um, one of the ways to do that, particularly in a subject like history or something, you know, ethnic studies where a lot of the things we talk about happened in the past, mm -hmm. um, you have to kind of connect the past to what's current and what's relevant to them today. So um, that's where I think the, the infusion of street lit, the infusion of hip hop music, the infusion of things cultural uh, today is, um, is relevant. I mean, the 26th was the two year anniversary of the Trayvon Martin um, killing, okay, a couple days ago, right? Now, this killing and this murder is very similar to uh, from a cultural standpoint, but also from a political and legal standpoint, as we saw in the past with a person like Emmett Till, in his case, how you have clear-cut evidence of a murder, but the man walks, you know, mm -hmm. for, for whatever reasons, okay? Not 100% not identical, but at the same time, very similar. So how can we connect the past and what's going on with, you know, the, the use of the 14th Amendment, the use of the right to bear arms, et cetera, et cetera? How do we see that happen in you know, 1955 it was, 54, 55, with Emmett Till, and how do we see that today in 2014, 2012, with a person like Trayvon Martin. So it's about using things that are relevant, and I think street lit, hip hop, you know, social current topics are relevant to bringing the student in. Mm -hmm.